morning. So welcome to Compassionate Response for COVID-19 um, with my buddy. Uh, so it's Wednesday, so I'm feeling like I'm getting going again actually now. So uh, did a good session on Monday on uh, brought in two philosophers, Hume and uh, Kierkegaard, uh, looking at um, imagination and uh, animism um, and some of the Thoughts of uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Uh, so these are all things I've, that are in my book that I'm interested in. And um, yeah, there's loads to. There's, once you get digging, there's loads to to explore, really. Um, but uh, before doing that, we're going to uh, do do a bit of body work. So, uh, can't to uh, just yeah, just start rub rub your hands together. Give your hands a bit of a squeeze. just we always need to give our body some attention real attention it's a real real aspect of our experience that we can't just ignore or we can just ignore it but it means that our energy is just really dull and uh, often our mind mental energy is dull as well you know so so this is part of the uh effects of uh, other certain philosophies that say that oh we you know we, that reason is the main thing so we just have to think about things work things out and it's almost like you know, separate from our emotions separate from our bodily experience uh, we're going to be looking at primitive culture a little bit today so you know, in primitive culture, they, they're not like that. They live very much in the world and uh, participating with each other. And the physical, the physical is really important. Well, it's, it's, there's no other, really. No other options. <coughs> Rub your hands together. Get some heat. And just put your hands on you, over your forehead, over your face, and curving your spine over so that you're symbolically turning away from the world towards yourself. And when you turn towards yourself, you might it might feel a bit painful or something, you know, because you've been you've got stuff going on. But in a way, there's no other option. You know, we do have to to face up to ourselves and what's going on at regular intervals, and then it's the only way we're going to have a deal with it, really. Sort of turning towards yourself, how you feel at the moment. <coughs> and then give your face a bit of a wash with your hands shake hands out okay, and then just drumming on top of your head your hand over the top of your shoulder, trying to stimulate the uh, your upper spine. The other side. And down your arm. 
back of your hand. Make it a little bit painful. The palm of your hand. Get the inside. On the other side there. Back of your hand. Palm. Sides. Circle in your stomach, clockwise. Lightly drumming on the back of you and your kidneys. Heavily on your buttocks. Down your legs. <coughs> Shake your hands and feet out. And then just put your hands on your stomach. And wait for your breathing to calm down. And notice when you're breathing in, when you're breathing out. And as you breathe out, bend your knees. As you breathe in, straighten your knees. So down on the out breath. Up on the in breath. Down on the out breath. Up on the in breath. And down on the out breath. Up on the in breath. Down on the out breath. Up on the in breath. Down on the out breath. So taking your spine, your whole torso down in one piece. Now just put your hands out the front, in front of your hips, and then on the in breath, bringing them up to your chin. Then turning at the chin, then down on the out breath. So as if you've got a ball that's you between your hands, it's coming up, centre of your body, and then it's going down again. So the centre of your body, it's kind of ball of energy. It's like bringing stimulation to your to your body, bringing energy, bringing chi. And then next time coming up and then up into the air and out to the sides and then down. So imagine that ball is coming up the centre of your body and then it expands outwards, gets bigger and then it down and then your hands come together again. It just gets smaller, comes up through the centre of your body and then it expands outwards again. Gets smaller and then it comes up the middle of your body. And this time, just slowly. Slowly, slowly, bringing your hands down by your sides. And just standing for a little minute or two. And getting used to being in a stationary position. How that feels.
and then without disturbing the any energy you've developed built up in your body or relaxation, uh, just gently moving into your meditation posture. Left me bell in the other room, sorry. Okay, so this morning we're going to do uh, mindfulness of breathing. And I'll be leading into a little bit of a visualization because that's the theme of today imagination. Settling down into your body. Maybe being aware of the uh, world outside, world of the senses, sights and sounds and Smells, tastes in the mouth, bodily sensations. So we, we're, we're never not in a world of sensations. So we're not trying to shut ourselves away from that in meditation, to shut it out. It's more that we're, we're, we're being in the world, but we're maybe choosing what to pay attention to. So paying attention to our body and the sensations coming into our body. And maybe having a sense that, uh, you know, those the five sense, five physical senses, the sight, sound, everything, um, they're, they're just, they just, the experience just comes in, it impacts on the sense organ, and it then turns into electricity, which moves down nerves into the brain you know, from the receptors on the skin and from the eyes and from the ears, tongue, and the nose, all turn into electricity and 
the, the impulse moves down the nerves into the brain. And that's just a completely natural process that we just allowed to happen. Uh, but we have a sense of receiving that world into a soft and, and welcoming awareness. And we also notice how we're feeling at the moment. So feeling is of three types. It's either pleasurable, painful, or something in between, just neutral. And sometimes it's to do with bodily sensation in our actual physical experience. Sometimes it's to do with the mind in terms of our thoughts and views about things. You know, we might have a, a thought about a view about something that might be painful or pleasurable. And it could be do, to do with our mind in general, our emotions and that, sort, that side of things. You know, whether we want something or not, whether we're getting it or not, will lead to pleasure and pain. And also maybe our emotional engagement with the world in a positive sense can lead to pleasure and pain. You know, we feel happy when somebody's doing well or we feel pain when somebody's suffering. So each of those different types of feeling um, requires a different sort of response, an appropriate response. So we accept the things that we can't change. We try and uh, act towards feelings in a way that leads to well-being for ourselves and others. We don't, we don't pursue dead ends in the sense of addictions and compulsions. Uh, we do pursue feelings that are about empathy, engagement with the world. In the uh, Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha says, you know, the monk um, brings mindfulness to their experience uh, with clear comprehension, awareness and passion. So uh, the word atapi means passion. Ta uh, it's like tapas means fire. So some sort of passion. Passion for well-being, passion for 
uh, creativity, creative engagement, imagination. So now just bringing your attention onto your breath. And we're going to do mindfulness of breathing, focusing on the detail in the breath, so not no stages today. So the idea here is that uh, if we're trying to be aware, then we have to know whether we're being aware or not, you know. And the other way we can do that is to have some sort of real thing in the world that we, we, we know whether it's happening or not. So, so we focus on our breath. But if we just focus on our breath, we're just vaguely aware that we're breathing. We can just drift off and still feel like we've been aware. But if we make ourselves try and be aware of the detail in the breath, what's ha actually happening in each moment, you know, kind of now and now and now, that the actual exp sensory experience we're having or experience of movement in the breath, then we know whether we're being aware or not. So it's about reflexive self-consciousness, you know, kind of knowing whether we know that sort of thing. And so just, just bring your attention onto the breath. Pick up the next bit of detail in the breath. And just keep following it from moment to moment. And if you get if you forget what you're doing, just come back to the next bit of detail in the breath. Try to, to know whether you know what's happening or not. Mindful breathing. And I'm just encouraging ourselves by thinking that if we, our mind is is kind of wrapped up with the detail of the breath, it can't be wrapped up with anything else like what we're worried about or other concerns. So we get a rest from all of that. What's happening right now in the in the breath in this moment? And the next moment, and the next. Just trying to give the breath some space to be as it is. And just allowing your body to just sit there. It knows how to sit down, it doesn't need any help from the mind to hold it up.
Uh, yeah, just receiving the world into a soft awareness. Looking for the detail in the movement of the body with the breath, the sensations, experience of the breath.
Uh, keep your mind relaxed. And spacious. And all you need to do is to just be trying to be aware of what's happening with the detail of your breath. Don't need to worry about anything else. So this is one way that we can refresh our minds. Just watching the gentle rising and falling of your shoulders as you breathe. And connecting with the breath down in down in your belly, down in the lower part of your body. Connecting with sensations down there as well. Changing sensations that you can say are happening that you're experiencing.
Okay, right. Hope you enjoyed that. I did. Uh, better for that. Okay, so I've um, got some material today on uh, imagination, and uh, um, so here's here's chapter ten of my book, imagination, the imagination. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I mean the history of, of my kind of thinking really uh, with with imagination it goes back to about two thousand and um, well early two thousands when I uh, I was doing quite a lot of um, shrines and things for Manchester Buddhist Centre. I was involved in a um, a thing called the Festivals Committee at Manchester Buddhist Centre. So when we sort of converted the the warehouse into Manchester Buddhist Centre in the mid mid nineties, um, after that, after we we had this uh, five story, fourteen thousand square foot warehouse, um, and uh, yeah, we, we yeah we wanted to kind of fill it with activity and things and bring life into it and all that. Um, and so I was interested in the, the um, you know, doing festivals and things, so the ritual side of it. So, you know, the Buddhist equivalent to Christmas and all that sort of thing. So, you know, you'd have Buddha Day, which is the anniversary of the Buddha getting enlightened, and uh, Dharma Day, which marks the in teaching, um, first teaching, uh, the Dharma, uh, teach, his teachings, and uh, Sangha Day, um, uh, celebrating the community of Buddhists, and then Padma Samva Day, which would be uh, uh, celebrating Padma Samva, who took Buddhism to Tibet. Um, yeah, and uh, um, at the time, it was me... Um, me, Vidyamala, and uh, Guna Ketu, who later went to set up Oslo Buddhist Centre. Um, and Vidyamala is now heavily involved in uh, breathworks, uh, teaching uh, mindfulness internationally, um, uh, particularly focused on people with, with chronic pain and illness and stuff. So, uh, yeah, so we're, we the three of us were all into... Uh, wanting to make more things happen in terms of uh, the Buddhist centre and the festivals and things. So we started having um, having uh, like a build-up to a festival rather than kind of like waking up and thinking, oh, it's it's Buddha Day next week, what shall we do? You know, we'd have a sort of uh, uh, a build-up where we're kind of getting people kind of ready and, um, so I think what this points to is that, uh, um, and the whole thing about, you know, things like Christmas and, uh, it's, it, it's a way of, it's an excuse to, well, it's, it's a, it's important, you know, it's just really important that we have times when we kind of like, we just stop and we mark something, you know, this is what ritual is that we kind of mark uh, an event or, a, or a, a reality really you know so so no matter what uh, uh, no matter whether it's kind of Christian or, or, or non-Christian Christmas is valued by everybody because it uh, in Christian countries mainly but you know valued by pe people in in in, the, in those cultures that celebrate it because it's it's marking our connection with, with each other our f families you know um, our religious connection if we if we're Christians um, and uh, and we have a, and we stop and we kind of like think of something we remember something important you know so it's like uh <coughs> 
can you imagine a world where he never did that? You know, like where he never stopped and uh, and marked what was what you thought was important. It'd be like it'd be like drudgery, wouldn't it? It'd be like life is just about you know. There's no well. It'd be like saying there's no meaning to life. There's just you know. There's nothing beyond what just what we do in every day. You know, our daily activities of survival. So. So in a way, um, that survival, being just in survival mode all the time, is like it's almost like it's kind of like the world of of the animals, you know, who are just concerned with survival, with eating enough, and you know, with procreation and and all that, and then uh, n- never get a chance to like look up to anything higher or. Um, or you know, have engage their imagination with anything beyond that, you know. Um, yeah, so I think this is a really important thing to to um, you know to bring to mind. You know that um, uh, thing. You know, some things are. Um, symbolic of greater greater things. So um, over the years, I've worked out a, a little bit of a kind of uh, theory in and around the imagination. Um, so this is this little diagram here. So you've got you've got your eye there that's the eye and then uh, over here you've got um the unknown the reality or the you know some sort of aspect of reality that you want to mark that you're marking with your ritual and then here in the middle you've got the action that you're doing to do that you know so maybe that wouldn't be sort of celebrating christmas um, and the reality that you're marking is your connection with with people, and your you know the importance of your certain relationships in your life, and your connection with you know if you're Christian with your with your religion and stuff. Um, so 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 why do we need this? You know why why does it work like this? You know, and what is a symbol? So so. The word symbol, um, sim means uh, something like, uh, sim or sin means something like the same. So like synchronous means at the same time. So, and bol means um, place. So, so a symbol is like something that stands in the same place for something else, which is, which is the reality that it's symbolizing. Uh, so, um, so you know, in Buddhism, uh, you know, the Buddha talks about reality being something that's quite difficult to take in, uh, and obviously, you know, it, it it is in its you know in its kind of greatest sense, you know, the sense of like impermanence and suffering, and you know, life life is full of that. It's you know, and we die in the end, so. So, so things like that, are, you know, we just function in the world in an ordinary way, you know. But there are some things that are just kind of outside of that ordinariness, you know. And one of those things is like the fact that we die. Uh, so it's like it's really hard to kind of incorporate that into our being, and um, it's like the the sculpture by Damien Hirst, The Shark in the Tank, you know, it's called something like uh, The Impossibility of Imagining Death in the Life of Somebody Living, you know, something like that. And fantastic piece of work, really, because it's really sort of focusing on uh, the what art's about, you know. It is about approaching... Um, you know the 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 bigger realities of life. You know, so um, 
So the, the, those those bigger realities can be um, things like you know our mortality, uh, but there can also be um, about how uh, having a um, a set of views that, we, and this is where religion comes in. You know, we have a set of we have a set of views that that help us cope with those realities. So we might have a set of views that say that you know there's a creator God in heaven and um, that we'll go to heaven when we die. Um, so the question really is like uh, with any view is that well comes to Buddhism, not just not just whether it's true or not, you know. Uh, so this is where science just kind of tries to 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 gain the ascendancy over everything. Everything has to be proven, you know. So it's not necessary that, uh, from a Buddhist point of view, that well, things can, often can't be proven. Um, things that are beyond our normal, uh, you know. Um, so. So what happens is, is you know, in, when things are beyond our, our control, our, our measurement, we have to actually uh, conjecture something, you know. So, you know, we we put forward a system in our mind, you know. So in terms of Buddhism, this system over here might be the fact that uh, actions have consequences, Um so this is the Buddhist equivalent of heaven and hell. You know, actions have consequences, and uh, uh, you know how we act now will affect ourselves and others in the future, our happiness and suffering in the future. So, so it's good to 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 be skillful now. It's, you know, instead of being good, we said talk about skillful. It's good to be skillful now rather than unskillful, because because that brings about happiness in the world. So, so. And for Buddhism, things fall apart. So everything falls apart that's, that we create. So we keep going. We keep trying to bring the positive into being, even though it falls apart. Um, and so the Buddha is perpetually transcending himself, you know, in terms of not just resting on, not just think, not thinking that anything is going to stop and be fixed and not fall apart. It will all fall apart, so... Um, so you know, so we so we need a way of marking that, which is, you know, when we see a a, a, a Buddhist statue on a shrine, that that seated meditating figure is representing the ability to to take to stay with reality and not be phased by it. You know, to 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 cope with old age, sickness, and death. So when we see a, um, so that in the meditation I was talking about, if you f focus on the detail in your breath, then it's hard for you to then focus on the detail of of something else, like what you're worried about, you know. So here, um, what we're looking for is focusing on on reality. The symbol helps us focus on reality. So. Uh, but to do that, the symbol has to be kind of like out of focus. So if you imagine the eyes looking, looking at reality, focusing on reality, then the symbol is out of, would be out of focus. So, so in a way, this re represents what a symbol is. It's like an out of focus version of reality that isn't to be taken literally, um, but is to be taken symbolically or poetically, you know. Um, so I've covered this in an, in another talk on poetic logic. Um, so yeah, uh, so I've, I've in um, I'm in in Tri Ratna movement. Uh, Sangharatit has focused. There's a, there's been a strong kind of emphasis on imagination and things like the romantic poets and stuff like Coleridge and Wordsworth. And um, 
uh, yeah, so I, I wanted to find out more about what Coleridge said. Uh, so I did a little kind of search on YouTube and uh, came across a, a scholar called Douglas Headley. Um, so here's a book he's written, uh, Sac Sacrifice Imagined by Douglas Headley. Um, and uh, I've got, you know, my uh, my friend Jin Ananda, who, who fortunately died of cancer a few years, about three years ago, um, was such a kind of, he had such a kind of absolute delight in words, you know. Uh, um, and, you know, a kind of a kind of upper class accent and a little bit of a Hugh Grant character. And, uh, but, it, it, so Douglas Headley, when I saw him on this video, it just reminded me of Jinanda, you know, he's kind of like, just like bursting out with culture, you know, kind of, it's just a love of language and, um, yeah, so uh, so, and he said some interesting stuff. So I, th I thought I'd get the book, get a book out from the university library. So, um, so it's called Sacrifice Imagined, and what he what he does focus mainly on is um, the um, uh, what they're called. So, oh, it's like the Platonic, um, the New Platonists, or something like that. These these um, scholars who who focused on on um, Plato, uh, on Plato and, and his ideas in the Middle Ages, basically, but but who were Christians? So. Um, Uh, yeah. Anyway, moving on. Uh, so, so what? What? Uh, <laughs> so, I'm just going to read something. Um, from uh, Douglas Headley. Uh, he says. Um, the problem, according to Coleridge, for his age, and indeed I would say for ours, is the inability to avoid a very unhelpful alternative. That alternative is between the merely literal and the metaphorical. That's to say, when somebody looks at a passage of scripture, their question is, is it literally, literally the case, or this, is this mere metaphor? Now, what he means here is... Uh, not a, not a metaphor in the sense of a sim that's that's symbolic. It's more um, uh, it's more more kind of fantasy. Something that's more to, to do with fantasy. So, is it literally true? This is what scientists say. And then people who are more into the arts, they they don't care, you know. And it's like, oh, it's a it's a you know, it's a, it's it's a helpful. It's a it's a metaphor, you know. So now Coleridge thinks that the problem with the alternative, in a literal sense, the well, alternative and either or, is it leaves out a much more profound dimension, that, and that is the symbolic. So what he's saying here is that, in a way, the sim there's, you've got literal, metaphorical, and symbolic, like three. The, the symbolic is a higher third in the middle there. Um, So, and then he quotes Coleridge, he says, and this needs loads of unpacking, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try and do it. Um, he says, the histories and political economy of the present and preceding century partake in the general contagion of its me mechanistic philosophy. Right, what's that mean? So it's like saying the Industrial Revolution led to a kind of... Um, a mechanical way of looking at things that is a contagion. You know, it's like a, uh, it's it's a, it's like a curse. It's a, it's something that's, um, 
that's that's like an illness, you know. Um, so and are the product of an unenlivened, generalizing understanding. So unenlivened. Yeah, it's like kind of dead. Uh, you know the uh, what Blake talks about the dark sat satanic mills. You know in in Lancashire. You know the factories just people working endless hours, uh, one day off a year, that sort of thing. Unenlivened, generalizing understanding. You know, generalizing everything is like this. Uh, um, it's all about you know it's all about kind of work and we all know what we all know what uh, you know, we all know the truth about things you know that it's like a, just a, this materialistic kind of uh, philosophy you know generalizing so it's like bringing everything down to the same kind of level um And then he says, um, in the scriptures, so this is the Christian uh, scriptures, uh, they are the living edicts of the imagination. So he's, he's now talking about um, uh, symbols and things. So um, Symbols are the living educts. So educt, duct means to draw out. So it's like they draw the imagination out. Um, uh, and of that, reconciling and media, media territory power. There you go. So there's something uh, that in symbolism that reconciles us to reality. Uh, so if we can put a, something in um, in place of reality as a symbol, then we can kind of come into relationship with it. Uh, we can kind of circle it. We can circle around it and um, see it from all sorts of different sides, you know. So in a way, that's what you do in in like Buddhist devotion. You know, you you you, you kind of have a shrine there. You probably together with a bunch of people, you recite poetic verses and those poetic verses just help you kind of circle what enlightenment might be, you know, because it's, it's it's ineffable, it's too hard to take in by the r rational mind. It's like a bunch of qualities that somebody has in massive abundance, you know, like wisdom, compassion and all that. I mean, how do you take that in, you know, except by trying to sort of circle it in some sort of way? Uh, and then he says to so these um, symbols, it's, uh, you know, which incorporating the reason in images of the sense. So it's in a way, it's like it is. It, so in images of the sense, so a, a Buddhist um, statue on a shrine is like an image of the sense, isn't it? Something we see and relate to through the senses uh, but it incorporates the reason so it's like it it helps our reason come into relationship with um you know with the reality that it's 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 representing so our reason can somehow become satisfied you know it's not avoiding reason it's quite complicated this but it's really interesting uh, it says, which incorporates in the reason and images of the sense um, and organising, as it were, the flux of the senses by the permanence and self-circling energies of the reason. Look at that. So it's like, it's, it, it's like, uh, It's like the reason also helps um, something come together as well in terms of the senses. So, so you know, when we're dealing with with 
with beauty, it's like somehow reason is involved in that. So often, the, like in mathematics, uh, they talk about, uh, you know, like a good theory because it's elegant. Um, you know, it's like the re reason often uh, is satisfied with something that's simple, you know, rather than complicated. So, so it's like the uh, aesthetics is often um, <clears throat> has this uh, self-circling energies of the reason. So it's like um, there's something satisfying. The reason sort of looking keeps looking around for satisfaction, and when it sees something beautiful or elegant or something, it's it it's it is it becomes satisfied. So so it's like we have to have. Um, this element in order to take our reason along we have to have this kind of this sort of uh, beauty it has to see the reason behind the symbolism you know in a way uh, so all of that gives birth to a system of symbols harmonious in themselves and consubstantial with the truth so consubstantial means you know, together in the same substance with the truth of which they are the conductors. So, yeah, so the, the you know, the symbol in here is the conductor of the truth over here, you know, so it conducts the truth to us. And in a way, there's no other way of doing that, you know. So, so in um, in biology, um, you've got uh, uh, you've got a couple of figures who are sort of in in opposition to each other in a way um you've got like you've got richard dawkins on the one side uh with um you know selfish gene and uh um you know kind of very kind of mechanistic scientific view that that everything comes from the DNA, and you know the DNA is like the the um, it's like the brain of the cell, uh, and that everything is kind of biologically determined. You know, um, gene being something called he calls non-overlapping magisteria. So a magisterium is a sort of a like a domain. Um, so it's like saying that science and religion don't overlap. Um, and uh, so in a way, it's like saying science has no business getting involved in in religion. Uh, and I've expressed this before, you know, in terms of science is to do with third person experience, you know, what you can measure from outside, what you can say, another person can say about, you know, something from outside. And religion is to do with first-person experience, like subjective experience. You know, it's your choice about what you show faith in. Uh, and uh, yeah, so and um, so Stephen, as a biologist, he's got a great quote here, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, about. Um, and he and he, he addresses the the criticism that's often made of religion by by atheists is that it's just comfort. It's about comfort. Um, he says religion is too important for to too many people for any dismissal or denigration of the comfort still sought by many folks from theology. Um, he says that I may, for example, privately suspect that papal insistence on divine infusion of the soul represents a sop to our fears. 
a device for maintaining a belief in human superiority with it, within evolutionary world, offering no pr privileged position to any creature. Um, but I also know that, that souls represent a subject outside the magisterium of science. My world cannot prove or disprove uh, such a notion, you know, the, of the souls. Of, uh, and the concept of souls cannot threaten or impact my domain. That's the domain of science, I think. Moreover, while I cannot personally accept the Catholic view of souls, I surely honour the metaphorical value of such a concept, both for grounding moral discussion and for expressing what we most value about human potentiality, our decency, our care, and all the ethical and intellectual struggles that the evolution of consciousness imposed on us. So, yeah, so he's saying that uh, no matter what's the case uh, in terms of faith, you know, whether souls exist or don't exist, um, he's saying he can't but honour the value that, that, se that seems to be in that as a metaphor, you know, for, because it grounds us, um, it grounds a moral discussion, um, and it expresses what we most value about human potentiality, our decency, care, uh, and our ethical and intellectual struggles. So, yeah. Um, so Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, in a way, would kind of like to, un he's a book called Unweaving the Rainbow. So um, he doesn't, he seems to not want children to study, to to come across like fairy tales or anything that might be uh, symbolic like that, you know, might be fantastical. But he's completely missing the point because, um, you know, as Steve J. Gould says, these these metaphors have a value, you know. They they teach us something, you know. So so when kids learn about Father Christmas, um, you know what they're learning about is the value of generosity or the value of connection or um, you know he comes around giving presents. So. Uh, you, you take that you take that out out you take that away and what you're left with you're not you're left with a lack of training in in the ways in which uh, you know we need to cope with life or approach life you know so all these stories that we get even though they're, they're metaphorical they're actually meeting a purpose the helpful speech you know so so it's, yeah so Buddhism has like four types of, 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 of skillful speech, truthful, helpful, uh, affectionate, and harmonious. So it's, it's important not just that things are true, but that they're helpful. And so mythology is, is, you know, is, is helpful. And yeah, I'll just finish on uh, a little, um, just talking about another philosopher. So this is from uh, 50 Key Thinkers uh, on Religion, Gary Kessler. Um, and uh, from a, a thinker called uh, Lucien Levy Brule, um, 1857 to 1939. So, so Brule like looked at um, primitive cultures, and uh, and you know contrasted the difference between what he called primitive mentality and 
civilized thought. So he says the, it says the key to understanding the differences is to recognize the role that emotion plays in primitive mentality. Primitive primitives are no less rational than moderns, nor should we think of them as childlike precursors of the inverted commas higher European civilization. Both civilized and primitive peoples are rational, but their interests and concerns move in different directions, move in a different direction because they allow a larger role for emotions. This leads to a mystical orientation in the sense that invisible powers often represented as spirits or gods colour their experiences of the world. This is animism. Hence, visions and dreams play a larger role in their lives and hidden, less objective associations often determine how they, eval how they evaluate or react to objects and events. Observations that might refute their beliefs, such as the failure of magical healing rites to bring health, do not disturb their beliefs because the evidence of sight so it's so important to the scientists is not their primary concern. They revere tradition, and if tradition says that ritual, certain ritual works, then it works no matter what others may say. The law of causality plays a, a crucial role in civilised societies, but not in primitive so societies. There is another law which Levy Brule called the law of participation, that trumps concerns with discovering causal connections. According to this law, humans participate in the life of other humans and even non-human animals and animate objects to the point of virtual identity. So a stone can be both itself and a spirit. If a man and a tiger arouse the same emotional association, then that man is a tiger. Things and events are linked not by causality, but by mystical participation. So I think this is really interesting that, uh, you know, we can, this is what you do in ritual. It's like you participate, you know, you don't stand apart from it. In fact, there isn't, you know, if a ritual is, if somebody claps at the end of a ritual, it's not a ritual, you know, because they haven't they haven't gone through something with it. They haven't participated in it. They've not. Often, you have enough some sort of ordeal aspect to ritual where you're kind of going through something, and in a way, you're going through this um, connection or relationship with the real with some sort of reality, you know. Um, and you're coming out the other side having had some kind of experience of that reality. So so the whole question of whether something is true or not is a is it it's the wrong magisterium, it's the wrong question. Um, what the question is is like does does participation in this ritual, in this this belief, whatever it is, you know, this story, does it actually lead me to be more in touch with certain realities of life? Does it help me be a better person? You know, does it help me relate to other people better? So all of that is what are the, are the questions that that kind of ritual and imagination kind of address. You know, you know the the practical in the sense of um, ethic ethics and. Uh, you know, imagine uh, connection with with reality through imagination. So, yeah. So it's been quite a long session today, um, but uh, hope we giving I hope we've given you some something to 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 think about. I think, um, yeah, that quote by Coleridge is really complicated, but it's actually saying a, a lot there. You know, about symbolism uh, of it, the way that it weaves together. Um, emotions, sensation, and uh, and and reason into something that helps us to approach um, 
aspects of the reality, you know, aspects of reality in life. Okay, thanks very much.